Good morning. Good morning, James. And you've got transition on your slides, which is, yeah, I have to navigate. It's fine. <laughs> it's good. Oh, dear. I'm terribly sorry about no, that. No, don't worry about that. Don't worry. It's all cool. Well, that's so we, good. we brought this slide up first. We, it's important to, for everybody to, to, to read the, the small print. So there it is. Um, I know you probably don't have time to do it properly, but you can always go back and watch it on the recording if you want to go back and read it, the whole thing. Um, but I'm going to start off with the usual question and get you to um, talk a bit about what the fund is trying to achieve, please. Well, before I do that, James, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on and, uh, and thank you for, to everybody for, for tuning in. Um, your introduction there and your roundup of news just reminds me why I've enjoyed my 30 plus years um, in the investment trust sector. It's full of full of intrigue, sometimes good, bad and sometimes ugly. Um, but, you know, what a wonderful, diverse sector it is to um, to, to provide lots and lots of investment opportunities to uh, to investors. Um, hopefully I'm going to talk today about Wisson being something that is neither good, bad nor ugly or indeed full of intrigue and uh, and something that, uh, that forms the cornerstone of, of lots of shareholders um, portfolios. Um, so what is Wisson all about? Um, Wisson was launched uh, well over 100 years ago now to um, uh, as an investment vehicle for one individual family. Um, 100 and something years on, we now have well over 20,000. Um, shareholders and nearly two billion pounds um, of assets. Um, our rationale or our, our our purpose, if you like, is to is to significantly grow our shareholders' wealth over the long term by investing in global equity markets through a multi-manager approach. Um, Witten is unusual in the investment trust world in that we are self-managed, which means that I and my colleagues are employed by Witten, um, and uh, and we work under direction from. Um, the board uh, to identify a group of managers who are specialists in their fields um, and we put those managers together um, to create a portfolio which we believe forms a, a good cornerstone for our for our shareholder portfolios. Um, the fact that we're self-managed we believe is important because it means that we're 100% focused on Witten. Uh, my colleagues and I don't have lots of a suite of lots of funds to to manage or to you know to, to go and uh, market etc we have one product and we're so we're absolutely focused on that um, and of course being self-managed our shareholders are ultimately our employers as well um, so 100 aligned we believe with our with our shareholders um, just uh, focusing on the nuts and bolts a little bit here um, and i won't go into too much detail at this stage very happy to answer questions um, but we are not a fund of funds. Um, we are uh, a multi-manager structure, and that's important because our assets are held in our own custody. We don't invest into funds run by other managers. Um, typically, we do have one or two, um, but the vast majority of our assets are held in our own custody. So um, we have absolute control over those assets. Um, we can never get gated, for example, if you think back to the Woodford um, scandal where, where people couldn't Get their money out of funds that can't happen to us because um we would just take those assets and reallocate them to a to a different manager if we felt that um that was something that we needed to do um also we have full transparency over our portfolio so for example last week when the news broke about silicon valley bank we were able to look real time into our portfolio and see okay have any of our eight managers got exposure to that company or you know what is our exposure to similar companies so um, so absolute uh, transparency, um, which, which we believe is, uh, is, is very helpful for risk control, as well as for understanding how our managers think and operate. Um, let's move, move on, James, shall we, to, um, to the next slide to talk about the portfolio structure. Um, oh, we've got one too far. There we go. Um, so thinking about how we structure the portfolio, first and foremost, we think about who are investors are, who our shareholders are, and the vast majority of our shareholders. Um, sorry, I know I'm speaking quickly, but I'm trying to canter through here because there's quite a lot to cover. Um, I want to leave lots of time for, for Q&A. Um, a lot of our shareholders are individuals um, and Wisdom forms quite a significant part of their portfolios. So we build the portfolio to suit that um, investor base. Uh, the core portfolio, which is approximately 75% of our assets, is allocated to managers who invest 
um, in developed markets, typically in developed markets around the world, they they do have the ability to buy into emerging market companies, but typically they'll they'll buy into developed markets. Um, those will be mega cap, large cap, and sometimes mid cap companies. Um, and typically, those our managers will look for companies that have enduring cash flows, um, sustainable revenues, underappreciated growth prospects, and occasionally, sometimes or or more than occasionally, um, into sometimes cyclical businesses which are undervalued. Um, currently, there are five global managers and one UK manager um, covering that part of the portfolio. Um, but we recognize that those sorts of more generalist managers are often unwilling or unable to um, invest into some more specialist parts of the investment universe. Um, so that's why we have um, a specialist portfolio or a satellite portfolio, um, which invests in areas or themes which um, have potentially higher growth prospects or they might be cyclically undervalued uh, for whatever reason. Um, so I, I noted James's point earlier about the launch of investment trusts are often done at the peak of a cycle. Um, well, quite often we can use this portfolio to invest into investment trusts that are at the bottom of the cycle. And a great example of that is BlackRock World Mining Investment Trust, which we bought into in 2014. Um, admittedly a year too early, um, but at the bottom of what was then a commodity cycle um, and have obviously enjoyed the, uh, the returns since then. But this also gives us exposure to things like emerging markets. We have um, an investment in a climate change strategy um, and through listed investment companies, we can invest into private equity and life sciences um, and, other, um, and other opportunities. So let's, let's move on a page. Um, this just gives you a very broad overview of how Witten is structured. We have the board that delegates many of the day-to-day -day responsibilities to us, the investment team. Um, we are responsible uh, for overseeing our investment managers, of which there are eight um, at the moment, and the board and the investment team is responsible for the appointment and oversight of those managers. Um, and then those managers obviously have a lot of investment managers and analysts within their organization. So buying a share in Witten gets you perhaps, you know, 100 or, or more investment individuals um, who are overseeing your, your portfolio for you. Um, and there we go. We've got a, the portfolio in numbers there, eight different managers. Um, we've got 235 companies in the portfolio. So each manager's portfolio is quite concentrated, um, typically between 20 and 40 holdings in each portfolio. Um, and that gives us what is called um, an active share of 79%. Active share is a measure of how different a portfolio is from the benchmark it is aiming to outperform with 100 being totally different and zero being exactly the same. So our portfolio is quite idiosyncratic and, and quite different from the benchmark, which we believe is important because to be to beat a benchmark, you've got to be different from it. Um, the portfolio is spread across 11 different sectors and in, and in countries, in companies domiciled in 26 different countries. So um, broadly diversified um, in terms of, uh, of risk by sector and by country. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got 12 specialist funds in the portfolio, um, giving us exposure to um, all those opportunities that sit outside the mainstream. Um, moving on, James. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but um, I think it's the, the most important points on this slide is that when we think about employing a manager, we do so thinking about what they have built their career doing. So, you know, we, we wouldn't select a manager to do something, you know, where they've got a proven track record doing one thing and we ask them to do something different. We very much want to pick managers who have got a proven track record doing something that they're good at. Um, typically, those managers a very sort of high conviction they'll um, every stock in their portfolio should count towards the returns that they generate um, and beyond a few minor restrictions such as they can't have more than 10 percent of their fund in any one company and they can't gear their portfolios and they can't hedge them um, those are about the only restrictions we place on on our managers um, so what happens therefore is that Witten's overall portfolio becomes molded and the, the and becomes the result of the, the individual manager's stock selection. Um, and one of our key roles is to oversee that and make sure that 
the combination of our managers gives us a portfolio that that operates that functions um functions well as a unit um and uh, the other thing i would point out on this slide is of course with our contacts and our network we're able to identify managers throughout the world um, we're not just limited to the uk um, and currently we have four managers domiciled or based in in the states and four um, in the uk giving us access across across the world equity markets let's go on james um these are the list of our managers at the moment um as i say there are six in the core and um and then the specialists, uh, the core making up 75%. And um, going through the list in term in order of kind of highest growth to, to, to most value. Um, Jenison runs six percent of our portfolio. They're a manager based in Boston. Um, that typically identify high growth, um, high quality businesses um, and, and companies that are um, really at the peak of their, their growth uh, trajectory. Um, we appointed them a couple of years ago with 4% of our assets, and we've added to them a couple of times. They're now 6%. Um, we've added to them as growth as a theme has underperformed quite significantly. Um, so at, at points of stress, um, that's given us the opportunity to add to that manager. Um, the next one is probably WCM. Um, they are based in Laguna Beach, California. Um, again, a manager who focuses on high quality growth companies, technology, healthcare, um, one or two uh, financials. Um, next one on the list, uh, Linsel Train. Sure, needs no introduction at all. Um, Linsel Train have been running money for Witten since uh, well over a decade now. Um, but we changed their mandate in at the end of 2019 from being a UK mandate run by Nick Train to a global mandate run also by Nick, but um, but the lead manager um, on the strategy is Michael Linzel, um, who works now with James Bullock as well, who's um, uh, and Linzel trainer strengthened the team away from just the two um, lead individuals. Um, I'm sure that strategy needs no introduction, but um, focusing on brands and on um, the high quality businesses with uh, with predictable recurring revenues. Uh, Veritas is the next on the list. Um, they look for quality companies that are that are cheaply or that that are that undervalued quality companies. Um, and then finally, Lansdowne. Lansdowne are quite a, uh, are quite adaptable, um, and at the moment they give us quite a lot of exposure to undervalued cyclical businesses such as as banks, materials, um, and uh, airlines, and um, uh, and various other uh, more capital intensive industries. Um, I won't go into huge detail um, on the specialist portfolio because it's there in black and white or indeed in pink and blue. Um, I will just pause on to uh, the GMO strategy, which I think is, is particularly interesting. It says climate change. This isn't about trying to identify, you know, next year's winning technology, whether it might be hydrogen or whatever else. Um, GMO was set up by Jeremy Grantham um, a few decades ago. Jeremy is a well-known value investor. Um, and this strategy is also a very well-known um, environmentalist. Um, this strategy looks to, to profit from companies that are well-placed to benefit from efforts to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So it could be solar power, it could be wind, it might be commodity miner it could be um a producer of materials that invests uh, that goes into battery technology or indeed the, the uh, energy trans transition um but also things like fertilizers because of course as climate changes um yields drop and fertilizers become more um uh, a greater requirement so it's a very broad approach to climate change and it's been a wonderful strategy for us to be invested in um for the last few years and we um we're, we're fully intended to be invested in it for the long term Let's go on, James. Um, just a brief pause on responsible investment. I'm really happy to go into lots of detail on this if people would like. Um, but I mean, it, it will come as no surprise to, to anybody that um, uh, the ESG in its broadest sense is, is, is you know, continues to be um, high up the, uh, the news agenda. Um, we believe it's a great investment opportunity as well as um, a, a risk control uh, function 
um, and indeed part of our social um, responsibility as investment managers. Um, but we don't believe there's a trade-off between investing responsibly and, and generating good returns for our shareholders. In fact, um, done correctly, um, the two go hand in hand. Um, what I will say on this slide is that we have committed um, to have a portfolio that's full of sustainable businesses by 2030. Um, to meet that commitment, we had to, had to define what we see as a sustainable business, of course. Um, and uh, and we, we put that on the four different pillars, prosperity, people, planet and partnership. And together with our investment managers, we've analysed every company in our portfolio um, to see where they are. Um, on that journey to being more sustainable over time. Um, I think we can probably go on to the next slide. Um, and I'm going to pause for thought in a minute. Um, but so the end product of all those different inputs is a portfolio that you can see on the left hand side that's diversified by geography. North America is the largest allocation at, in the high 30s percent. UK about 20%, um, Europe about 21%. Um, it's worth, it's worth re-emphasising uh, re that our asset allocation is the result of our manager's stock selection. So um, although obviously we have a view on where asset allocation should be, and I can talk a little bit about how we can adjust allocation um, later on, um, this is the result of stock selection and happily it coincides with our view of the world that equities domiciled in the UK and in Europe uh, remain uh, undervalued and a, a potentially a, a better investment opportunity than those um, in North America. Even though, of course, valuations have come down in North America, we still feel that um, European and UK counterparts offer better value at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, sector spread, you can see there it's it's pretty evenly spread across across most of the uh, the major sectors around uh, around the market. Um, going on to the next slide, uh, we can see the top twenty holdings. Um, now there's three there's two hundred and thirty companies in the portfolio, so I wouldn't put too much emphasis on the top twenty. Although the top twenty does account for thirty three percent of the portfolio. One caveat is, of course, the number one position is GMO Climate Change Fund, which has 100 underlying investments in it. Um, so at 6%, um, that probably is, is making more of, of, um, of, of its dominance than it, than it, you know, than it should do. Um, we have a number of our what we call direct holdings in investment companies in the portfolio in the top 20. They're starred there with an asterisk. So Apex Global Alpha is a private equity vehicle. So is Princess Private Equity. BlackRock World Mining, I mentioned. Um, in addition to the GMO Climate Change Fund, we've got an investment in VH Global Sustainable Energy Opportunities, which is another fund which looks to benefit from um, increased spending on the energy transition. Um, and Syncona there at number 14 on the list um, is a life sciences investment company. Um, which we have been invested in for uh, quite a while, although initially it was a much bigger position than it is now because we we took quite a lot of profit out of that um, when the shares were trading at quite a significant premium to asset value. Um, I'm sure the rest of the names on the list need no introduction whatsoever. The smattering of, of banks, of technology companies, consumer goods companies, um, and, uh, and indeed... Uh, things like uh, transportation as well with Canadian Pacific Railway. Uh, moving on. How are we doing for time, James? Am I all right? Um, we're not too bad. Okay. Should we do a couple more slides and then I'll hand it open? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll whiz past the ESG and numbers. I mean, basically the, um, the bottom left chart shows you the outcome of our um, exercise that we carried out with our managers. Um, it shows that uh, the vast majority of our companies are doing very well in terms of our assessments of their sustainability, but obviously there's there's more work to be done over the next um, the next few years. Um, moving on to the next one, your your carbon intensities oh. breached yes. the, the line there. Are, are yes, people going back into sort of oil companies or, or what's yes. what's happened? Very very observant of you. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Two or three of our managers at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, and indeed in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, 
um, increase their weighting in oil companies. We've always had a very low weighting in oil companies, kind of one or two percent. Um, by the time we got towards the beginning of the fourth quarter of last year that number was up to about five percent so obviously the impact of that is um is to increase the carbon intensity of the portfolio um it's also worth stressing that when we talk to our managers about their carbon foot the carbon footprints of their portfolio or indeed esg in general we're very much focused on the evolution that the companies are going through rather than trying to we don't we don't impose any um, restriction on our managers and, and what they can invest in, apart from they can't invest in in controversial weapons. Um, and we think it's important that um, that they're able to invest in companies that are that are doing real good, even if right now their carbon footprint might not be. So actually, in our annual report, we put in a case study about um, engagement with um, ArcelorMittal Steel, which is a, obviously a steel manufacturer, steel being the worst industry in the world probably for carbon emissions um but companies like Oslo are making great strides and they invested um i think it was a billion euros in in spain this this year or last year to try to, to develop out a, a greener um steel plant so they can be the solution to the problem as well as um as well as the contributor to it so so that's what we think about when we think about our transition to a, uh, a more sustainable portfolio is I think, I think companies that like that are really set to benefit from um, investments they're making today because people will pay a premium for, uh, for better quality steel over time. Mm. Just to clarify something, mm. are you voting the shares or are the underlying managers voting the shares? Managers. Right, okay. So we, uh, you know, we outsource the selection of stocks to our managers. It makes no sense to us not to outsource the voting as well, because you know those they're the people who know the companies intimately, um, and they are the people who also engage with the companies as well. Um, we don't outsource engagement. We believe that it's our managers who should do that. Cool. Okay. Um, I'll just quickly touch on this. Um, I mentioned that we have various tools that we can use to um, to adjust asset allocation if we feel that the stock selection. Um, needs a bit of tweaking um, but also we have other tools we can use to to help drive performance so gearing is the most obvious um, Wisson is is fortunate to be of significant size and therefore um, we've been able to issue long-term fixed rate they're actually called private placement notes but you can think of them as bonds um, and the longest maturity is is to 2054 so very long dated the average coupon is three percent so we're borrowing um at a significantly cheaper rate than the the uk government um and that's we believe very advantageous to our shareholders um and that's 155 million pounds um we didn't want all our gearing to be in fixed rate long-term debt because that gives you less flexibility so we do have short-term variable rate debt as well that's um, good we talked about that last week actually Oh, did you? Alliance and FC, not not yours, but but same thing, really. I mean, twenty fifty four. Yeah. I would say three percent. Three percent. Yeah, it is cheap. Um, so <laughs> just it, just as an aside. <laughs> yeah. So so when the um, what did they call it? A fiscal event. Um, the mini budget. Mini budget. Um, came out at the end, you know, last year. Um, bond yields in the UK. Um, you know, went went through five percent, and um. And actually, we were able to go and buy gilts at that point because we felt that we were borrowing at 3% to 2054 um, and we could invest that at 5% on a similar tenure. Um, and, and obviously what happened is the Bank of England came in and said, um, you know, they'll do whatever it takes. And, and so what was potentially a long term investment became a short term trade. Um, but that gives you an idea of how flexible we can be. Um, you know, we're, we're able to take advantage of those sorts of situations cool okay all right um we, um, buybacks 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 yep um no no that well, it's on, first, it's sorry. On, we were on the previous slide oh sorry okay. yeah. Yeah. there we go back again yep sorry um you know we, the board has always stated said that it, it um it seeks a sustainable low discount or premium to asset value um and when shares trade at a, at a, at a discount we'll buy them back and so we've been quite active in buying shares back we believe it's our obligation as a company. Uh, we believe it's good for our shareholders. 
Um, it helps to limit the discount. It certainly helps to remove discount volatility. And more importantly, it provides an uplift um, to the remaining shareholders. So just as an example, last year we made 11 million pounds through share buybacks, which pretty much um, offset all the uh, ongoing charges uh, for Witten. So that just puts it into perspective, um, the amount that can be generated um, through assiduous use of, of share buybacks. Good. And I'm just going to talk about dividend and then we'll hand it open. Sure. So progressive dividend policy. Um, the dividend has increased every year since 1974. Um, because it's the Tottenham Gold Cup today, I thought I'd look to see what happened in 1974. And it was the year that Red Rum won um, <laughs> his second Grand National. And for the musically minded, it's also the year that ABBA won the European Eurovision Song Contest with Waterloo. Um, so there you go, 48 consecutive years. Um, the, the board is, is, um, is obviously very mindful of that and, and uh, is committed to, to continue to increase the dividend. Um, it's supported by revenue reserves at times where um, there is a revenue shortfall. And clearly, you know, 2020 through to this year, um, companies are still recovering from COVID. So there has been a bit of a revenue shortfall in the last couple of years. Um, but as you can see there, 35 percent up this year versus last. The, um, the cover is rebuilding quite rapidly. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to pause there, James, because... I'm sick of the sound of my own voice and I'm sure <laughs> and I'm sure yeah. people are probably sick of the sound of my own voice as well. Um cool. I'm really right, happy then. to um to open it up. Yeah. Now, if it if I've got it, no, I need to make it stop now. This is the this is the trouble I have with these things. Right, there we go. Fair enough. I quote it first. So I mean it is just two percent of of the, the portfolio. I mean, but actually we talk about unquotists. You're, so unquoted funds are things like mm -hmm. limited partnership type things. Is that right? Um, yes and no. Um, so we we differentiate this little bit, this this little sleeve from the investment company sleeve, because within the investment company sleeve, we have listed private equity vehicles. OK, um, so there is some exposure to unquoted companies through the investment company sleeve, but those are typically yeah. through listed vehicles. Um, the unquoted funds, it's two funds. Um, one of them is run by a venture capital manager based in San Francisco called Green Oaks. Um, this vehicle is, is called Lindenwood. Um, Green Oaks look to identify um, what they describe as companies that deliver a jaw dropping experience. Um, so it's internet enabled businesses primarily. Um, and what's really interesting is Green Oaks were in the news earlier this week because they wrote to all their, their investee companies, uh, advising them to take their deposits out of Silicon Valley Bank um, in November last year. So clearly they've got their finger on the pulse um, and we're very happy to be invested alongside them or with them. Uh, but this fund uh, is a Guernsey company. Um, it's not listed, but the, the plan at some point is that it becomes, because it's an evergreen fund, it's not a... Um, an LP with a seven or 10 year life. Um, the plan is at the right point when it's fully invested and at the right point in the cycle that um, this fund will probably get listed, possibly even in London. Oh, cool, that's a good idea. Yeah, Bill, I like um, Capital did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and the other the other fund in that sleeve is, is run by one of our main managers, which is Lansdowne. Um, and it primarily looks to, to benefit from investing in companies which are effectively based on the IP that spins out from some of our great universities. So Oxford, Cambridge, um, you know, some of the London colleges. Um, there's lots and lots of IP that comes out of those universities. And um, and, it look, and, and the, the, the partners at Lansdowne are very well connected um, in that um, in that universe. So that's but it is only small. It's two percent oh, of assets. Yeah. Well, the question is, are you planning to increase this um, exposure? Um, not in a hurry. Um, they were two individual opportunities that we that we saw. Um, there's never say never. You know, if we were to see another opportunity, we could certainly add to it. Um, just to, to just to clarify one thing, um, we sort of top down we think about the specialist portfolio as a whole being 25 percent of Wisdom's assets 
Um, within that, we can have about 50, we can have up to 15% in investment companies and 15% in other. So obviously you can't have 15 and 15 because that would be 30. Um, but what you can do is is flex within the, the specialist portfolio. So there's no reason why the unquoted funds bit couldn't be bigger. Um, but we'd have to take money from one of the other um, themes within the specialist portfolio to increase it. But so the answer to the question is, yes, it could be bigger. It, you know, we could well add to another uh, investment. Um, you, you probably won't see it materially bigger, though. OK, cool. Um, in terms of the geographic asset location, is mm. this being fairly stable or is this something that, that moves around quite a bit? It's been fairly stable. Um, I mean, I don't want to get into the minutiae of, um, you know, benchmark evolution over time and all that sort of thing. But um, we we have increased our exposure to North America primarily on the back of um, the fact that we see greater long term potential for lots of companies domiciled there. Even that's notwithstanding what I said earlier about in the short term, we feel that there are greater opportunities in Europe and the UK um, over the long term. The North American exposure has increased for Witten, and I believe it will continue to increase. Um, the it, it hasn't changed dramatically over the last couple of years. Um, what we have seen is the European exposure increase, um, but that is really as absolutely driven by manager stock selection. Um, and one of the things that we saw at, towards the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022 was a couple of our managers buying into European companies. For different reasons. So Jenison, uh, who I mentioned earlier, high growth manager, they kind of took shelter from the massive sell off in what they call emerging growth companies. Um, so these are companies that might be profitable, um, but might not be with very high growth rates. Obviously, they were absolutely shattered last year in the sell off in growth. Um, and they took uh, took shelter, if you like, in lots of European, you know, high fashion branded goods companies like LVMH and um, that sort of thing. So that drove our European exposure higher. Um, and at the same time, company, uh, managers like Lansdowne have been buying into Irish banks or indeed Ryanair. So, you know, although it sits in a European allocation, it's probably less, less European than you might initially think. Um. There's a question here about stock weightings. Now, so I, I, I don't know what I don't know what the answer is going to be. So the question is really about: um, Are you happy with you've got sort of underweights to some stocks? And it's talking about Microsoft and Google. Mm. I mean, is there anything you can do if you feel very strongly that you ought to have more exposures to a stock? Is there anything you can do to, to change your portfolio like that, or, or do you to just just not your problem? You just leave it to the managers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the straight answer to the question is we we want our portfolio to be driven by the stock selection of our managers. But what we need to be cognizant of is that we have the right managers in place to give us exposure to any or all opportunities um, as and when they look to be the right things to be investing in. So one of the reasons why we appointed Jenison and WCM, who together we um we classify as our kind of highest growth managers more likely to own those big us tech names for example one of the reasons we appointed them was to give ourselves the ability to own those big tech companies if those managers felt they were the right thing to own at the time so you know we're happy to be to have a under underweight to a stock for example apple you know apple is three uh, you know nearly four about four percent of our benchmark um, yet we only have about half a percent of our assets invested in Apple. We're happy with that. I mean, we would have rather have had more of it, obviously, um, at certain times. Um, but we're happy for um, selection to be driven. Sorry, our, our stock list to be driven by manager selection. Um, the second answer to that question is, yes, we can do something about it if we're particularly concerned. Um, and I did gloss over it, but we can use and have used um, ETFs. Um, and indeed uh, futures sometimes, um, but we'd only use futures on main market indices like the S&P, the FTSE, um, the Nikkei, um, and sometimes the Euro stocks. Um, but we can use ETFs to get exposure to, um, uh, to indices primarily rather than individual stocks. We'd never make 
an individual stock investment to to kind of overcall our manager stock um, decisions, but we can from time to time and have from time to time used um, ETFs to um, to increase exposure to uh, to various parts of the market if we think it's the right thing to do. Within the kind of specialist portfolio, would you do you buy funds because they're on discounts, or is that just a sort of um, nice thing to have? Do you actually want exposure to the underlying? Um, I'd say it's the icing on the cake. I think the important thing is to have a cake that's edible. Because, <laughs> um, you know, time and time and time again, you see, you know, investment companies that on the face of it look attractive um, on a discount basis, but actually it just becomes either a value trap or a lobster pot. In other words, a value trap, you sit there, you buy it cheaply, and all that happens is the NAV comes down to meet the share price. Um, or alternatively, something that looks cheap, but you can you can buy into, but you can never get out of, hence the term lobster pot. Um, and so all of the companies that we buy into in the investment company sector, we first and foremost, we're buying because of the underlying assets. Um, being slightly contrarian in our thinking, um, we tend to invest, identify assets when they're at the bottom of the cycle rather than at the top which naturally leads us to be able to buy things at a discount rather than a premium. We are a bit averse to paying a premium for um, for an investment company, but we will do so if we feel that, you know, the assets are, are good assets. And for example, BlackRock World Mining, you know, that's been trading at a premium uh, on and off for the last year or so. Um, we haven't been desperately running for the exit just because it's trading um, at or above asset value because we, we felt that there was it was much more important to get exposure to the underlying assets than to, to worry about whether it was at a 5% discount or a 2% premium. Can you talk a bit about sort of your view of markets generally? Um, there is a specific yeah. question here about um, with the business with SVB and Credit Suisse, whether there's an opportunity to buy financials now on that mm. critical thing. Um, yeah. but I'm just curious because there's also a question about what's your view on inflation and interest rates. OK, um, why don't I take I'll take those in the order that you that you ask them um, in terms of. Whether we believe there are opportunities in financials, I mean, that is something that we very much leave to our managers to, to decide, you know, which sectors or which companies they want to be invested in. What I can say is that we have spoken to a number of our managers over the last week. And one or two, you know, in in the in the wake of um, you know what's gone on both in in Silicon Valley Bank, but also in Credit Suisse, um, and one or two of them have definitely voiced their opinion that there are some very high quality banks that have been marked down on the back of what we believe is a kind of idiosyncratic uh, risks and blow ups. In um, you know, as, as I said, our, our VC manager based in San Francisco identified Silicon Valley Bank as a potential issue a few a few months ago, yeah. um, and Credit Suisse has been in the headlines for God knows how long. So those are banks that were clearly fundamentally weak uh, for one reason or another. Um, but I think the the whole sector has been dragged down with it, and we've seen that because we we don't own many banks in the portfolio, James. We've got. Um, in fact, one of the first things I did on Monday morning was look through the portfolio and say, OK, so what do we actually own? Because I've got a pretty good idea because it sits on a screen in front of me and I see it every day. Um, but I'm, I was pleased to see that, you know, we own Lloyds Bank, we own NatWest Bank and we own a little bit of Barclays. Um, and then we own two Irish banks, AIB and Bank of Ireland. And we have no exposure to any single US bank no bank in continental Europe and no bank in Switzerland. Now, you know, that's not me saying, aren't we clever? We've avoided um, one or two of the hotspots at the moment. But um, I think there's, you know, there, there are potentially opportunities, but we'd leave that down to the managers. Um, and your question was about interest rates and inflation. Yeah. Um, we, wrote a, we wrote in our annual report that was released this week, and I urge everybody to read it because it's a wonderful read. Um, but perhaps not all 126 pages of it. Um, we, we wrote in our annual report that um, 
that we think that um, inflation is peaking. Um, and I, but I think the market might be wrong in making the assumption that interest rates are going to be cut, uh, unless, of course, this you know the banking crisis becomes a crisis. Um, because obviously the primary responsibility of central banks is to maintain um, stability um, and they're not going to continue to raise rates if if raising rates is going to fundamentally undermine the banking system. Um, but what we believe is that um, inflation is peaking, but that and interest rates are peaking, but that that peak will look like Table Mountain, not like the Matterhorn. So in other words, um, rates will stay high for a while or high, say high i mean four percent five percent is hardly high in in you know those with a long memory um it just feels extremely high because they've got there extremely quickly from a very low base um so no we think rates will peak they'll stay at this sort of level for a while and then gradually um decline rather than being cut quickly and okay. we think that's good for our portfolio we think that's good for equities um that um, you know, companies are able to um, to focus on what they're good at rather than being buffeted by, you know, the one offs like COVID and uh, and the horrendous um, situation in, in in Ukraine. With the gearing, you, you said you bought some guilds. I mean, how do you manage to get what what, what drives the level of the gearing? Um, what, what's the sort of thinking behind it? Um, well, we always say that we, we we aim to have gearing that's appropriate for market conditions. I think, um, you know, it's a balance between uh, it's a balance between our interpretation of short term risks and opportunities versus um, long term outlook. Um, we're fundamentally pretty positive on the long term outlook. Um, there are some risks, clearly, um, but we think that the the benefits outweigh the risks uh, as we are at the moment um i mean typically our gearing is capped out um we, we can't be geared more than 20 percent um we will at, we'll stop investing when the gearing is at 15 percent because obviously what you don't want to do is find that you have to take evasive action if you're wrong and the market declines 20 percent so stopping investing when gearing is 15 percent gives us that cushion to be able to if we take the view that the market is sold off irrationally you know to keep the gearing in place and that's what we did um when uh in this, this time last year when market sold off quite dramatically and um we kept the gearing in place and we were thankful to keep the gearing in place because obviously as we went into q4 in the beginning of this year um markets were um, recovering quite nicely um, but well, well, typically, I mean, our, our our kind of neutral is neutral space is probably about ten percent. Um, it can flex up to about fifteen and down to about five. Um, a couple of times, it's been lower than five. That was in the global financial crisis, um, and for a short period during the the COVID pandemic, where we felt that the risks were just un unquantifiable. Good. We've covered an awful lot of ground. I'm conscious of the time, so I think we're going to have to. Um finish there unfortunately um actually you've got some outlook slides i should have put that up when we talked about that earlier on but there we go um yeah. but thank you very much for doing that this morning that's that's really helpful and um we will get you or andrew back on again uh any year or so's time and and find out how things have gone but um but thank you very much i'm aware james that there, there are a number of there might be a number of questions that have gone unanswered um i don't know how this normally works but if people want if if you want to share the questions with me i'm really happy to go back to people with an answer if sure. um um if that's something that you can do yeah uh, sure. okay. either yeah uh, because I, I i hate asking questions and not having them answered and yeah. um, so <laughs> um i'm really happy to um uh, to clarify anything if people want them clarified great thank you james my pleasure um i hope everyone enjoys the weekend when it comes indeed well it's raining again now but there we go um cool so we will be back next week we're talking to richard stavey he's the manager of rockwood strategic um which uh, you may remember is one of the sort of better performing uk equity funds of last year uh though it, it had a bit of a struggle to to survive and and do a bit of a tussle over who was going to run it and um, so we'll find out where it is now and and what the outlook is for that fund next week 
Um, and then the week after, we're talking to the manager of Gore Street Energy Storage. So um, thank you very much for tuning in today and have a good week and we will see you next time. Thank you.